The signs are all around us. The stakes are high. A healthy future hangs in the balance. Join us for a journey around the globe as we examine how we all are being affected by the growing climate health crisis and what businesses, leaders, artists, and everyday people are doing to solve it. This is 24 Hours of Reality. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Welcome, I'm Vanessa Ock. Thank you for joining us for 24 hours of reality. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. We know the truth. The climate is in crisis and our health is at stake. We are standing at a crucial moment. Our fossil fuel dependency is creating dire pollution related health consequences. Extreme weather, infectious disease, water and food scarcity are taking tremendous tolls on the health of individuals, communities and even the economies. The situation is urgent, but there are solutions we can embrace today, from renewable energy to sustainable agriculture and forestry, low carbon transit and efficient buildings. For the next four hours, we will be exploring the powerful ways people are coming together to create real change, from reducing carbon in Mexico City to fighting to shut down neighborhood coal plants right here in the United States. Travel with us tonight as former President of the United States and the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project, Mr. Al Gore, leads the way around the globe. This year, we come to you live from the Los Angeles State Historic Park, situated in an area that is considered the birthplace of Los Angeles. In addition to being a beautiful setting along the Los Angeles River Greenway, the site marks a powerful community and environmental triumph bringing the California State Park's mission to some of the most underserved communities in the nation's second largest city. From this home base, Vice President Al Gore will join us to speak with world leaders like President Carlos Alvarado Quesada of Costa Rica. We'll also be joined by passionate celebrities and enjoy incredible musical performances from the Lumineers, we treat, and in this hour, we will be treated to a live performance from NACO right here on our stage in Los Angeles. To see the full rundown of guests, you can visit 24hoursofreality.org. And now, for the next hour, we will continue our journey in Central America and the Caribbean. During this broadcast, we'll be looking at several broad areas where the climate crisis and our dependency on fossil fuels are creating dire health consequences, including extreme weather, pollution, infectious disease, and food and water insecurity. Each of these are interconnected and have rippling effects beyond their initial health impacts, such as mental health conditions from prolonged stress and PTSD, and climate conditions that pass between conflict and violence, as well as displacement. To help you understand the risk we face and what can we do to help, we'll be looking at each of these health pillars more closely, one at a time. Right now, we'll explore the impact of food and water insecurity with a short video hosted by Mandy Patinki. Take a look. Our climate is in crisis. Our health is at stake. We think of climate crisis as something we can't really see. But look around. It's already affecting our food and water. Extreme weather is wilting farms and changing how crops grow. Groundwater supplies are drying up in some parts of the world. Elsewhere, thawing glaciers that provide water for billions are slowly disappearing. Rains, increasing drought, and skyrocketing temperatures are all contributing to a world with less clean water and healthy food to go around, threatening the well-being of people and communities around the world. When it comes to our food and water, the Climate Health Connection works like this. Burning fossil fuels fill the atmosphere with carbon pollution raising temperatures worldwide. That means less snow piling up in winter. Snow that used to feed rivers and reservoirs come spring. It means longer droughts and less water seeping down into the earth and restoring critical groundwater supplies. And it means glaciers that store water as ice are melting at unprecedented rates. It all adds up, less water for the farms and streams that feed us, 
less water for us to live. In these conditions, yields of crops like rice, corn, and wheat, staples that feed the world are threatened. It's a danger that expands right as the world's population is too. As hotter becomes the new normal, large parts of the world are at risk of losing the crops that have supported them for generations. Imagine Bordeaux without wine, Brazil without coffee, a world where chocolate becomes scarce as the Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Indonesia get too warm to produce cacao. It's more than heat. The climate crisis is throwing seasons out of balance and fueling all kinds of extreme weather, threatening global food supplies. Devastating storms and floods strike harder and more often, sometimes wiping out entire harvests. Rain and frost increasingly come out of season and destroy crops. And pests and diseases are spreading further across our planet, reaching regions once too cold to support them. Crop blights like wheat rust, molds that can make us sick and stunt children's growth, are slowly expanding their reach. Plus, scientists are beginning to understand a new threat. Elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are depleting protein and key nutrients like iron and zinc in crops. The food we've eaten for centuries is slowly becoming less nutritious, putting countless people at risk of malnutrition. Bottom line. It's a direct connection from burning fossil fuels to a world where nutritious food and clean water become scarce. But today, we can skip the dirty stuff and protect our health and power our lives with clean and affordable renewable energy. In a world where our health is in the balance, the choice is clear. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Find out more at climaterealityproject.org. And now, Costa Rica's President Carlos Alvarado Quesada joins us via satellite from San Jose to discuss the impact of climate crisis on Costa Rica with former United States Vice President Al Gore. It is such an honor for us to have you join us in this 24 hours of reality. Thank you very, very much. The climate crisis is impacting everyone globally and all nations and Costa Rica is no exception. I'd like to begin by asking you to describe some of the changes that you are already seeing in Costa Rica. Well, thank you, Mr. Gore, and it's a real pleasure to be here. What changes are we experiencing? For example, uh, floods have become more more strong in, in Costa Rica, and that has an impact directly in many communities, especially the most vulnerable. Most vulnerable communities live uh, closer to the rivers, and they have the, the hardest impact when there are floods. Mm -hmm. Also, drought. Uh, next year, we're going to experience uh, a, a, a phenomenon, El Niño, which is going to provoke drought on the Pacific, but also potentially floods on the Caribbean, and that's going to impact especially the most vulnerable communities mm. in Costa Rica. And we have seen impacts, for example, on the temperature on the water, which has an impact on, on the fisheries and also on the biodiversity at seas, but also at, um, at, uh, at our forests. Because of changes in temperature, biodiversity have started moving looking for their appropriate temperature. And that is affecting the ecosystems because species that are not meant to be in certain ecosystems are entering there and having an impact on biodiversity. So those are several of the things we've seen uh, uh, as impacts from climate change, not to mention the impacts on the quality of air uh, because of the emissions of, car of fossil fuels. Mm. Well, thank you. That's a very sophisticated listing of uh, the impacts, and I appreciate that. Uh, and next, I would like to focus on the fact that Costa Rica has emerged as one of the real leaders in the community of nations in tackling the co climate crisis and helping to solve it through its work in reversing decades of deforestation with very successful initi initiatives to protect your land, your seas, and your wildlife. And of course, uh, 
most of your country's electricity is produced without using fossil fuels. You're blessed with a lot of hydro power, but immediately after taking office this year, I certainly noticed that you announced your intention to make Costa Rica the first carbon neutral nation in the entire world by 2021. I'd love to hear more about your plan for achieving this inspiring goal. Well, this goal was set by the country several years ago on so matters of carbon neutral, making Costa Rica carbon neutral. And that came from a paradigm where uh, people were thinking in Costa Rica to do certain actions to uh, mitigate current emissions. We are proposing a new paradigm which is most more ambitious. Uh, we're looking that we have this electric clean matrix, mostly from hydro, uh, but also from uh, electricity from the wind and other clean sources. We have almost 100% of our electricity being clean and renewable, but from our total uh, energies, 70% are still from fossil fuels, mainly in transportation. What we have um, realized is that if we plug our electric clean matrix mm. in our transportation through electric technology, through a electric train that we are uh, in, in the process of building, uh, through electric vehicles, uh, we can manage in in the midterm, I'm talking about uh, 2050, to completely eliminate fossil fuels in our economy. The goal in my government is to prove that by disengaging the curves of growth from the curve of carbon uh, of fossil fuels usage. That means that we can still propel growth at the time that we start reducing our consumption of fossil fuels. For example, this week we have started changing the fleet, the vehicles from public institutions, from diesel and gasoline to electric vehicles right. to propel this new paradigm in which we're not only aiming at being carbon neutral, but going further to a complete decarbonization. 70 years ago, Costa Rica managed to abolish the army. Uh, that was a courageous decision. And my generation, what it's proposing is that we need to abolish f use of fossil fuels. And that's the goal we are, we, are, um, we are aspiring. And we are also trying to send this message loud and clear to the world because it's one that currently and ethically is necessary to inspire people to, to take action. That's incredible. I, I, it it uh, is in a phrase I've used uh, every once in a while, music to my ears. But a, a plan to completely ban fossil fuels in Costa Rica is a huge undertaking. I'm interested in what the response to this plan has been from the people of Costa Rica. And uh, can you discuss your roadmap for accomplishing such an ambitious goal? Well, the response has been positive, uh, but I want to double click on that. It's been positive uh, bet between the, the youth, young people see that as a very ambitious but uh, great goal to accomplish in our generation. But we need not only to, to recruit the enthusiasts of this, uh, of this uh, goal, but also we need to go further and to, to, to to recruit people that are not really aware of these problems and how we, we manage to do that or how we are doing that. One, electricity as a means of transportation is cheaper than fossil fuels. We have estimated that it can be uh, almost 70% cheaper using yeah. electric electricity for transportation than using fossil fuels. Also, because it's cleaner for the air, so it's more pure air, uh, and also because it's an energy that we do not need to import, that we can produce locally. So we use those, those uh, arguments to, um, 
to recruit people. That also means that we are going to reduce cost of production and be more competitive by using those technologies. So that's the way that we not only use inspiration and ethical means of climate change to inspire and recruit people, but also using another kind of incentives as, as the, um, the, the self-benefit uh, from an economic standpoint or from a health uh, standpoint. And what's the roadmap? Well, currently, we are changing the, the public fleets also to create scale for um, to, to, to have more, more, more imports in the appropriate technologies. We are building two trains, electric trains, one to connect the main urban areas in, in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. another for, it's an electric cargo train and that we can reduce lots of our emissions. We have an ambitious plans also for transformation in agriculture to reduce emissions. And also with the Brown Agenda, uh, we have a lot to cover on that. But by saying that, and that's the, the, inspiration, the really inspirational fact, the fact that we have a 100% clean renewable electric matrix, and now that we have technology for transportation that uses either electricity mm -hmm. or hydrogen, we're also experimenting with hydrogen as for, for transportation, that tell us that we have to change that other 70% of uh, energy that we use from fossil fuels to, uh, and we can make that change, we can make that happen. Uh, so our goal in, the, in my administration will be to disengage growth from consumption of, of fossil fuels in 2030 to be in a more gaining scale uh, so that we estimate that 10 years from that uh, we might be abolishing completely the fossil fuels. This decarbonization plan and all the details we are launching uh, early next year. Uh, our Ministry of uh, Environment will be in Poland on COP discussing it with some other counterparts and, and we want to lead in this, in this, in this in this area. Not only because it's about all the whole world, it's about an ethical issue, it's about multilateralism, it's about peace, and those are values that are embedded in, in Costa Rica. So we see it, in, myself personally, we see it as an ethical issue we, we ought to lead in this matter. <laughs> I'm almost speechless because I'm so impressed by the scope of your vision and your country's vision. Uh, and I'm impressed that you have connected the dots to understand that transforming the transportation system to a, an electric system in the matrix you have available will actually reduce the cost of transportation for all your businesses and new businesses that you might recruit uh, and therefore make Costa Rica more competitive in the global economy at the same time. I, I take it that you are also talking about electrifying uh, the public transportation also? That's right, that's right. Uh, we have to, actually what we need is to uh, most people should be using uh, electric transportation, but public transportation, because that, uh, that way we can reduce also uh, problems on the roads. We lo currently, we have lots of, of uh, problems because we had lots of cars, so we are aiming at people using more the train and that kind of, of transportation. Um, that's, and also, being more competitive, uh, it's really relevant because let, let's say that that's a, a more selfish um, how you say, uh, motivation for several people that not necessarily are that into climate change, but we need to recruit everyone in this. So we're also putting that perspective to, to, incentive, uh, to incentivate people to, to, to work with us. I should say, by way of full disclosure, I have a very tiny interest in two companies that are involved with uh, uh, electric buses, and I, I wanted to fully disclose that, but I have long been a very enthusiastic supporter of this initiative. I want to turn to another uh, topic, and that is one that was briefly mentioned uh, earlier, and that is deforestation. Uh, and Costa Rica has been tackling deforestation, uh, and your nation's unique 
environmental services payment program deserves much of the credit for your remarkable success in reversing deforestation. I know other countries are bound to be interested in how you achieve this success, so could you tell us just a little bit about this uh, program and your plans for going forward with it? Sure. Uh, during the 80s, uh, we discovered our, our first coverage uh, of the whole country uh, reduced dramatically to 20% of our territory. So we went like from like 50% of our territory uh, covered with forest to almost 20% uh, in a very short period of time. We were losing biodiversity, we were uh, having lots of emissions. Uh, so the country developed a program actually is financed by a tax on, on fossil fuels which uh, has a fund for financement of environmental services and that's basically paying owners, uh, private owners of land to preserve forests or to grow, grow new forests in areas that are uh, key for, uh, for several services. For example, for protecting water, for protecting or giving more coverage to areas for biodiversity, complementing areas, for example, of a national park, of a national reserve. Also because of tourism. One key element is many of the topics related to climate change, people tend to argument that they destroy the economy. Conservation is a way of not developing economically. But the, the example in Costa Rica is actually that from the 1980s to the to 2000, we managed to recover that forest coverage, and now we're uh, more a bit more than 50 percent of our territory has uh, again is covered by forest, mainly because of this uh, payment of environmental services program, which also has proven to be positive for the economy. Why? Because not only provides uh, the payment of the owners of the land, it also can work together with agriculture, that's uh, mixing reforestation with certain agricultural practices. And it's also uh, profitable from an ecotourism point of view, because lots of people uh, can benefit from small businesses for hotels, for tourists, for ecotourism, uh, and also it protects the, uh, protects the water. Um, so the benefits of investment in this kind of, of programs mm -hmm. of conservation, it's not against the economy. On the contrary, it actually helps to build a, yeah. a new kind of economy. And that's a message, that, a message that we want also to share. These kinds of policies uh, are not uh, anti uh, growth. On the contrary, they actually propel growth. And that's a message that we need to, to say loud and clear because, um, as I mentioned, many people are, as us, we're enthusiasts of this. But then we need to recruit more, more other people to be part of this, of this movement if we want to, to change to really happen. Well, your agenda and your leadership are so inspiring. You mentioned agroforestry and Several years ago, I began shifting my small farm in the state of Tennessee to agroforestry, and you mentioned ecotourism. <laughs> and years before that, I took a, a trip to Costa Rica, and I want to recommend uh, a visit to Costa Rica for anyone who is interested in ecotourism. It's such a beautiful country. I wish we had more time for this interview, but we do not. Uh, but I would like to close where I began, with an expression of gratitude, uh, for you and your leadership and your vision and your country's leadership. It is a great honor for you to take part in 24 Hours of Reality. Thank you, Mr. President. Climate Solutions start with you, which is why we want to hear your voice. Every hour we will be checking in to see how you're taking action and what your questions are on social media. And for that, we are going to go with the very talented actors and activists, Ivana De Maria and Arad Berke. Hello, welcome back. Welcome back to the social media corner where we'll be checking all of your activity, everything you, we've been talking about, your posts. We're very excited to see 
what, what you've been sending us. So please keep sending it with the hashtag 24 hours of reality. I'm Ivana de Maria. I'm Arab Bethke. We're going to be here in the next segments talking to you, opening up the conversation, and telling you a little bit about us and why we got involved in all of this. Tell us, why did you get involved well, in all of this? Well, my interest in, in, in <laughs> um, environmental causes started when I was really young. My dad really liked to take us out to nature and hiking and, and diving, and I realized there was so many plastic waste in the oceans, and this is something that from a really young age I started realizing was becoming a, big, a bigger and bigger problem and a bigger and a bigger issue. And just being here today with uh, such inspiring people, hearing all these amazing ideas has been really, really uh, inspiring in a way of seeing the transformation and how it's really growing throughout the world. But most importantly, we're really happy to see your stories and yes. how you guys are, are interacting. A, you and know, many times, uh, it's, it's through stories that we can really relate to certain situations, certain issues around the world. So it's really important that you voice your stories, that you voice your activities, your efforts, your posts really do matter. They are heard loud and clear. We will make sure to talk about them. Here we have a couple of examples. Well, let's go through Matt Perry, Aaron Perry. Um, you know, you, you guys found 86 kilograms of plastic and you picked it up in one hour in the beaches of Colombia. I think that's amazing. That's amazing. I think everybody could do that. I try to recommend to people that any, anywhere you go, you know, try to pick up two or three pieces of, of trash. That's a very simple yeah. way of helping. And then um, also not using plastic. Let's try to not use so much plastic. I think it's a really simple thing that we can do Definitely. in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we're on a big uh, non-plastic policy in our home. Yes. We don't use plastic straws or plastic bags. I think that's a great way that all of you can, can contribute a little bit and realize that it's it's not such a big effort. It's not so hard. It's day-to-day, exactly. -day, small little actions. Things, right? There's little things that you can do that really do make a difference. And, and, and really, it's a, it's a collaboration in the end of the day. It's a teamwork with everyone around the world. We're so excited that there's so many posts from everywhere around the world. This is incredible. Um, don't forget to tag us, hashtag 24 hours of reality, so that we can keep reading your posts. Yeah, keep on sending your questions, your thoughts. And, um, well, now, from here to perform live on our Los Angeles stage, let's please welcome Nako.
a certain goal. A pattern of physics you roll. Don't believe are you told and open. Open up your fist, a misconception. You can fight like this and praise. With the power of prayer of God on our side, you can take the stairs to the heavens. Flipping through my chapter seven, I live with the snakes and the great deception. No court in this country for men who steal from the mother on paper with pen and we're tripping down a red dirt road and we're asking is this the way we should go kissing soft top feet oh my god is we walk the earth baby yeah we got this focus and it's redirected grateful and i'm resurrected stubborn but i know the way you the skin on my drum to your rhythm i will sway take my hand I won't lead you astray. We will not go gently into the darkest of days. Grandma's here, and she says, persevere. Take a walk in her mark. It's a trail of tears and our fears. Are the same as the ever were beers. Numb the pain of a Holocaust tears. Always mobbing in motion. Baby, baby, be an island or a notion. Your arches, how they bend and contract on my conscience. Move a slip through the grip of my laces. And my theory is I shine. Presence, a deliverance, yeah. Oh, let us figure out when she's dead, or if they get lost in the stars, stars, in the stars. So many parts to a heavy heart. beautiful and powerful. Our next guest is the strategic advisor on climate change at Often and the former ambassador to the United Nations from Grenada. So please welcome Ambassador Desima Williams, who is joining us remotely from Grenada. Thank you, Ambassador, for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Ambassador, you are passionate about educating people about the urgency of tackling the climate crisis. What has been the public response and what is the best way to deliver this message throughout the civil society in a way that they can personally connect? Thank you very much. Um, the main impacts of climate change started to visit the SIDS, the small island developing countries. And I actually I started that journey in 2009. And we found that our publics were already educating themselves and becoming engaged because the impacts were on them so intensely. Um, we are the most vulnerable countries in the world. And so I would say that the SIDS led the international public response um, to understanding what was really unfolding uh, with climate change. Uh, we now have momentum. But it wasn't always that. In fact, I'm pleased to say that we have momentum among a very ambitious goal of uh, limiting global, average global warming to no more than 1.5. I, I think the presidents of uh, Kiribati, of Vanuatu, of uh, Fiji have been on the forefront, on the front lines. Um, there are two prime ministers from Grenada. So if you will, I, I want to insist that many of the small island states who felt this terrific early impact um, have been very active in, in, in getting the message out. What would you say, Ambassador, is the biggest threat in Granada and the wider Caribbean region as a result of climate, the climate change? Well, the threats are at all levels. It's a, it's a threat for survival, first and foremost. As the sea level rises, um, we have many coastal communities. Our full uh, infrastructure is on the coastal areas, our seaports, our tourist um, um, uh, docking ports, um, our roads, um, uh, villages, they're all mainly on the coastline. So that's quite an, uh, a threat to our lives, to our infrastructure, 
to our mangroves, to our um, ag seacoast agriculture, even on a cultural level, because in one of our smaller islands, um, the cemeteries are near to the sea, and the sea is rising up and stealing away the very graves of people um, buried. But there's more than that. There are impacts on impact on our water supply, the impact on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the impact psychologically. We're never sure when is the dry season anymore and when is the rainy season. They've merged a bit. So planting and, and growing and harvesting are also under threat from the impacts of climate change. Ambassador, what would you say are the most vulnerable populations to the climate crisis in Grenada, and what makes them more vulnerable? Everyone is vulnerable in a small island. Um, this An island the size of Washington, D.C., twice that size, it means that whether it's a sea level rise or torrential rains or high winds, all the island is, is uh, impacted. And however, we could turn to the coastal areas and they are the most vulnerable, the poorest in the worst housing or um, farming areas will have to, will remain the most vulnerable populations. But I'd like to say that on small islands, such as Grenada, many populations, uh, physical infrastructure, um, projects for development are constantly threatened. Of course, our finance is threatened because rebuilding is costly, whether for individual families or for the state. In the case of Grenada in 2004, we lost 200% um, of our GDP in Hurricane Ivan. And so um, the, the hurricanes threaten our sustainable development and our economic development. Ambassador, you have said that the sustainable development goals should be a responsibility of everyone and not just in the hands of governments. Can you identify these goals specifically and how members of the civil society can attain them in their daily lives? Um, let me then remain on the climate goal in the SDGs, climate goal number 13, which calls for climate action. Uh, everyone has to be engaged in that, in education. This year, one of our uh, national secondary school debates was on, on the climate. Um, that's a form of response. Um, the population is switching to more solar, little wind. That is a response, and that's also SDG number seven on energy. We are making a very slow transition to electric cars. I hope to see more of that in the future. Um, we're also using more, uh, uh, less uh, plastics. There is a movement to reduce single-use plastic and to increase uh, cloth and straw. Um, and I think that's part of the national response as well. I'd like to put in a plug here for the, for the national governmental response, which is to build resilience. There is a now a, a consorted effort to... Um, mainstream the concept of resilience, and Grenada will probably be one of the first countries in the world to have a ministry of climate resilience so that we can educate and we can accelerate a range of SDGs. I want to speak also about education, um, that we, we are including in our education uh, a skills building, vocational and technical skills that will help us uh, with uh, a new kind of uh, um, organic and uh, uh, climate resilient agriculture. Um, and even you know, for our big tourism uh, is our big sector to educate all stakeholders about the risk of tourism. I think we have more to do. We have to improve our land use policy. Um, we have to really make more financing available both for communities as well as for the state although we have a bit of a head start in the Green Climate Fund and in the SIDS DOC, which is our renewable energy platform for the uh, islands of the world. So I think um, as far as the SDGs are concerned, uh, the, the, the climate threat 
will make attaining the SDGs impossible. So educating about sustainability and resilience, practicing uh, many uh, policies, for example, SDG 2, to eliminate and reduce our food waste. Um, we have a national um, zero hunger commission that's part of our response to SDG number two. And I must mention women. I must mention that we have a vigorous women's movement. It's a little weak now, but it has historically been very strong in getting women to the decision-making table, um, which is SDG number five, has to be and is part of the response, whether that is in civil society or in the private sector or in the state. We do have an increasing yes. number of women in the decision-making uh, sector or, uh, so that we can, in fact, take on board women's experiences, women's knowledge, and of course, our ideas and suggestions. And, and th those are wonderful initiatives, Ambassador. Thank you so much for being, being with us and for all the work that you do. Thank you. And now let's check back with Ivana and Arab to see what you have been saying on social media. Welcome back to the social media corner where we've received great posts. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have a lot of furry posts actually, which is great because as we know, one of the main impacts of climate change is to animals. So we love the fact that you're, uh, you know, getting your animals involved in these posts is really fun. This one is great. I am particularly a fan of huskies. Uh, thank you for sharing this. Never fails to widen my own awareness of how much we are interconnected to one another far and near. It is true. We have a responsibility to our animals and that is a big, big part of today's conversation. And also, not only animals, but I think we're all interconnected in the world as human beings, as a human race. As we've seen today, it's been going all around the world. Physical, geographical boundaries don't really matter when, when it concerns uh, uh, climate change. Let's see another one here. Um, we're concerned about the climate crisis and have been watching 24 hours of reality for so many positive changes everyone can make for our planet. Go vegan. I think that's amazing what you this say. This is a great picture. Yeah, Thank those three guys, sharing. I think they're all for, for, for helping yeah. in the climate crisis. And uh, we personally have a dog. So, I mean, we think it's, it's a great way of involving ourselves because animals have been really, really affected. Not only dogs, but all kinds of wildlife throughout the world. Definitely. And here is a picture of a viewing party. We highly suggest viewing parties. This is a great event to have a viewing party for. Yeah. Uh, spending our day having a watch party at school with 24 hours of reality with the next generation of climate heroes in Oceanside, California. Thank you. Yeah, thank you are you so definitely much. the next generation of climate heroes. This generation, our generation, has the power in their hands to, to decide the future of our environment. So thank you for, for being the next generation of leaders. Yeah, and I really want to encourage young, young generations to keep on talking about this and sending us our, our tweets, your questions, your suggestions. With I the think, hashtag. Uh, yeah, you guys have 24 hours of reality is a hashtag. Um, and then this is a really interesting one. We went solar and you can too. CRP leader and Richmond Solar Co-op creator. Uh, today, uh, alternate er energies are, are becoming more and more present in our day-to-day -day lives. It's this not is... something that it's hard to achieve, hard to attain. So I think we should all look into these new forms of energy. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it back to Vanessa so we can continue to the next segment. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll see you very soon. Over the last hour, we have spent time getting to know some of the health challenges faced by the people of Central America and the Caribbean. We have explored the many ways people are taking action to solve the climate crisis and create a healthier and more sustainable future for all. Remember, you are the most powerful advocate for your health. As we have seen, we stand at a crucial moment in the climate crisis. Today, as the world leaders gather in Poland to once again review their commitments, urge them to take the strongest possible action required to ensure a healthy future for all. Go to 24hoursofreality.org, where you can share the news and insist upon urgent action now. When we protect our planet, we protect ourselves. It started out as a climate crisis. It's become the greatest health crisis we've ever seen. You've watched it happening, first in the headlines, today maybe right outside your window. The world's getting warmer, and heat waves are turning lethal. Storms are getting stronger, putting millions of us in harm's way. Diseases are spreading farther and faster, 
If you're a farmer, plant diseases and pests are showing up sooner and hanging around longer every season. Rainfall patterns are changing. Food and clean water are getting harder to come by. It's all connected, and it all goes back to our burning coal, gas, and oil, fossil fuels. We're taking ancient carbon and putting it in the air. We're producing greenhouse gases that are heating up the Earth's land and ocean. As temperatures rise, dangerous heat waves, droughts, and wildfires are happening more and more often. Things are changing faster than we can deal with them. Lakes and rivers are both drying out and flooding. Crops are withering or drowning. We can't grow them where we've been growing them for centuries. Warmer seasons mean mosquitoes can carry diseases like Zika and malaria more quickly. And the extra heat throws the water cycle out of balance, leading to more powerful storms and floods and droughts everywhere from Florida to the Philippines. Meanwhile, fossil fuels also fill our air, water, and soil with toxic chemicals that make us sick, causing everything from asthma to brain dysfunctions that last a lifetime. And this, by the way, is really bad for our kids. If you think it adds up to a more dangerous and unhealthy planet for all of us, you're right. But here's the good news. It doesn't have to be this way. Today, we can skip the dirty stuff and protect our health by powering our lives with affordable, clean energy. Best of all, a clear majority of people around the world want to do just that. It's time to act. After all, our health is in the balance. The choice is clear. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Hey everybody, this is Joseph Gordon-Levitt coming to you from Los Angeles. So, today, the climate crisis, it's not just arguments and hypothesis anymore, it's affecting people all over the world. And while most of the world's leaders have agreed to act, we've also had setbacks. So now, it's up to us, you and me and every one of us, can help continue the momentum and build a clean and healthy future for everybody. So join me at 24hoursofreality.org and demand that your leader increases their commitment to protect the planet, and protect ourselves. Don't let anybody stop us from solving the climate crisis. Thanks. en Costa Rica, en una zona rural, en Guanacaste, donde tenía mucho contacto con la naturaleza, los animales, los ríos, y tenía la posibilidad de, si quería comerme una fruta, ir a tomarla de un árbol. Todas las personas podemos ayudar a cambiar nuestro mundo. Podemos hacerlo con pequeñas acciones, podemos empezar reciclando, siendo más conscientes de los alimentos que estamos consumiendo. Protejamos nuestro planeta, protejámonos a nosotros mismos. Our climate is in crisis. Our health is at stake. And it's not just you. The weather is getting warmer. Storms are getting stronger. Droughts are lasting longer. And it's all connected. The bottom line, our climate is changing. And as weather gets more extreme, it puts all of us in danger that is increasing by the day. Fossil fuel pollution has driven the change in our climate by trapping more of the sun's heat. Today, warming temperatures are creating more severe hurricanes, droughts, fires, and floods, all putting our health at risk. The heat is dangerous all by itself. Heat waves are getting hotter and lasting longer, breaking one record after another. When temperatures get this high, the weather can turn deadly, with outdoor workers, children, and the elderly at much higher risk of everything from heat stroke to heart attacks to death. More heat also means water evaporates faster from the ground, rivers, lakes, and oceans. When fields dry up and drought stretches on, farmers struggle to keep their crops alive and feed us all. Families, even entire communities, are forced to leave their homes, the ones that they've had for generations, sometimes with deadly consequences. It goes on. Parched conditions also mean more frequent and ferocious wildfires, 
devouring homes and choking the air with smoke and toxic fumes that can spread for thousands of miles. All this heat starts a dangerous cycle. That's because warmer air holds more water vapor. So when the rain finally comes, it can strike with torrential force, unleashing lethal floods and landslides. Over the ocean, this extra energy and water vapor becomes fuel for hurricanes, turning everyday storms into powerful forces of destruction. Wind gets more ferocious. Rains get heavier and hit harder. The headlines show the results. Widespread injuries, trauma, and even deaths. But what they don't show is the aftermath, how weeks and months without power can cripple communities and cost many, many more lives. Bottom line, it's a direct connection from burning fossil fuels to more fires, severe storms, and heat, making our world more dangerous every day. But today we can skip the dirty stuff and protect our health and power our lives with clean and affordable, renewable energy. In a world where our health is in the balance, the choice is clear. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Find out more at climaterealityproject.org. El depósito de basura más grande de Centroamérica está en Guatemala y está a punto de colapsar. Es importante saber que para poder ayudar a nuestro medio ambiente podemos empezar por nosotros mismos en nuestra casa, en, con nuestra familia. Quise convertirme en una Climate Reality Leader porque considero que es importante que nos eduquemos y podamos educar a los demás para así poner un, un grano de arena y mejorar nuestro planeta. I'm Sting. I am Shaggy. And we are honored to be a part of this year's 24 Hours of Reality. No matter where you live, the climate crisis affects you. Today, we understand the stakes are higher than ever. It's up to us all to stay aware and stay active. Together, we can build a healthy environment for everyone around the world. Join us at 24hoursofreality.org and let the world know that we demand continued climate action. When we protect our planet, we protect ourselves and our children. Tonight we're gonna to do something special. What I want you to do, I want you to take your lighters out, everybody. And I want you to, um, where's my lighter at? Put on your lights. Put them up. Because we're going to do something really special. Are you ready? and steel are one drying in the color of the evening sun tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away There's something in our mind will always stay perhaps this final act was meant to clinch our lifetime's argument that nothing come from violence and nothing ever could for all those born beneath an angry star Lest we forget how fragile we are On and on the rain will fall 
fall like tears from the storm like tears from the storm on and on the rain who say how fragile we are how fragile we are ice cold as a heart for protection act as a shield to avoid a rejection Sometimes we ain't that we able to feel. We acting all super, we ain't made of steel. Weep through your anger, you'll find tears of joy. Give thanks for the blessings that you have enjoyed. Beautiful flower in this concrete garden. Fragile at heart, but we're still so hard. Let's go next. On and on the rain will fall like tears from the star, like tears from the star. Make some noise for Sting! is in crisis. The signs are all around us. The stakes are high. A healthy future.